to have all of you here with us. I hope you're enjoying it this afternoon. Uh, what we want to do for the next 20 minutes or so is inspire you. And to do that, I have inspirational leaders, thinkers of a new way of seeing things in city. So I hope you will really uh, in enjoy the next few minutes. I have Amanda Burden and also Andreas Kipar. Uh, I'm sure you will be familiar with their work, but let me start with you, Amanda, because this is all about immersive nature in cities. And we come to this two years after the pandemic, and we're going to have images that we're going to share with all of you, hopefully that will get you inspired to get those creative juices flowing, and we'll talk about them. But in your words, what is immersive nature? Well, I think you can begin to see it on the screen. And it's something that people maybe haven't imagined, maybe haven't thought about. And this afternoon, I think we're going to talk about why, how important it is. But if you see it, if you can't imagine it, you can see it, then you will want it, then you will ask for it, and then it will happen. So we are going to brainwash you with immersive nature Yeah, today. we're going to greenwash <laughs> their, yes. their minds. This is in Essen, Germany, and immediately once you look at it, uh, you begin uh, thinking about Essen perhaps in a different way, because I always think of it as an industrial region in the rural area. Um, but, you know, we do come to this after the pandemic. Maybe it's the first time that you're all getting together after a number of years, so it's unique in that aspect. But also... Is designing open spaces different after COVID? Do you want people to think about it differently? Yes, and first of all, open spaces, public open spaces are of course key to making a great city. But the trauma of the pandemic has really changed spaces and what we're needing from them. Citizens are looking now for greener, more expansive spaces. Uh, perhaps not your traditional parks and your parklets, but healthier, lusher spaces, places where they can get closer to nature. Uh, and one of your projects as well, if anybody is not familiar with Amanda's work, uh, but I think you probably are, uh, is the High Line in New York, which was something that was so transformative and of course rezoning that city um, as well. So I want to come back to some of the aspects as well, the beneficial aspects uh, of projects like that. But you, Andreas, you know, you've talked about really radical change and that public space needs to be connected to a new kind of nature. Uh, well, there we have the high line behind us Why? there. Um, what do you mean by that, a new kind of nature? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, to be here. And uh, obviously, as a gardener, as a landscape architect, we are, we are so uh, well trained uh, uh, to, to deal with, with plants, uh, planting trees and so on. But the new kind of nature is a, is a new kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. We are uh, mainly looking for, uh, for a new kind of relationship with our urban soil, with uh, the cycle of uh, water and uh, uh, with our biodiversity in the city, bringing back nature into our cities. That is, that is something really important. And uh, I wonder if, uh, if it will be possible after COVID, mainly after COVID, to create a new kind of uh, typology in our cities, uh, a garden, a park, a boulevard, a square, everything fine, but then free nature. Free nature for free, open public space. So that is what uh, we are mainly looking for. And I know these mm -hmm. images will kind of help us think about uh, changing perhaps the way we look at things. But, but what are you looking for, Andreas, with that shift that you talk about from the previous thinking? Uh, well, well, we are we are now understanding everybody. I, I feel more and less, and also yesterday we heard it here uh, uh, that it's not enough to make business as usual. We need and we we try to find out a radical change. So be radical. We don't have time, they taught me. But on the other side, time to act is now. So uh, what can we do? We, can, we need to do something very radical, and uh, radical will make, break it up, break it up so much asphalt in our cities, so much concrete in our cities. Bring the green into our buildings, not only on the roof, but into the buildings. So there are so much opportunities uh, to 
do the same things but in another way. So more radical, showing what does it mean when nature grows up. And we feel so well connected to nature when we can see by daily, daily working what happened in our cities. And it will be not only a, a lovely park, we have a lot of lovely parks, but it will be something else we can see, a new ethic aspect, I think, needs also a new aesthetic aspect. Uh, but do we know, uh, for example, Amanda, about the lasting <laughs> positive effects on the individual? Because it's great to see some of these grand projects and they definitely change the urban landscape. But what about the individual? Well, I think we heard a, that, a little bit about that yesterday during the panel that you moderated. But we know, we instinctively know, and studies have shown uh, that nature, being immersed in nature, is beneficial to our health and well-being. We know it lowers our stress level, it increases our productivity, improves learning, um, it even uh, increases our recovery rate mm -hmm. during, uh, during illness. Um, but it also, the whole idea of immersive nature is also, and we want to hopefully talk about this too, important to our city's health and well-being as well. well. Well, let's talk about that because I think the first pushback probably uh, that people might have is like, oh, hang on, this looks amazing, but it's going to be too expensive. And what is the economic rationale or benefit for cities um, and, and how they might, I suppose, prosper as well in, in whatever respect? Well, we heard a lot about this during the today and yesterday, which is that cities have never been under greater stressors, and we know what they are. And there are the stressors, really, they're you know, um, existential threats uh, from the climate crisis. And we know it's extreme heat, and it's flooding, and torrential flooding, and sea level rise, and, uh, um, and pollution of our... It can contain our rainstorms. It can eliminate heat or reduce heat and fires. Uh, it can cool our streets and can actually clean our waterways and our air. And we're just not talking about trees. We're talking about what you see on the slides. This is radical, as Andrea always says, radical, deep, immersive nature within cities. And that's what's radical. It's not in the outskirts. It's bringing that within cities. And it's worth it because, uh, you know, cities are going to have to prepare for... So these investments are going to prepare cities for climate-related events. And if cities did this collectively, they oh, could yes. collectively... More and more cities do that than they could repair the planet all together. Yes, indeed, one, one city at a time. I'm just looking at Bangkok there, which is also a place <laughs> that I visited, but oh. I remember the heat and the concrete is yeah, what yeah. I remember. What do you think when you see that picture, Andreas? Well, I think immediately about uh, uh, reconnecting people with nature. We are nearby, so nature is not far away. It's not outside. In our 15-minute cities, it is nearby. It is in our own community. So it creates a certain kind of ownership. And, uh, and by the way, it's, uh, it's a really important aspect uh, in uh, climate adaption. So it seems uh, like a rain garden. It seems like a biodiversity garden. It seems something that can change day by day. And, uh, and by the same way, we, 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 are, we can go in. And let me say, that is something uh, maybe... The, all the things we learn in the past, everything fine and it's good to see, but then we need to have in our future cities, we need to have also open space for nature coming out by themselves. Mm -hmm. So that is what, what I call in a German word a little bit like rustical. So very, very strong and people want uh, to feel it. That is identity, that is a soil urban identity. It's so interesting that you say that because I am, the panel I did yesterday was on loneliness uh, and urban nature and uh, one of my guests, Christian, was bringing up this sense of belonging yeah. and, and you're talking about ownership. So there's definitely that connection there as well. But I know you're talking about being a disruptor, Andreas. I think that's what I'm hearing. How do you create or get people on board, perhaps people in this room, with radical change? Because it can be difficult, scary sometimes to try and, and make that happen. 
I know Amanda's not scared of it, but go but on. <laughs> more or less, 89% of European citizens uh, uh, like to have a new relationship with nature. So nature is so important. And they ask this kind of new relationship. But they don't... Maybe the participation will be so important. So Jan Gehl taught us that first people, then space, then architecture. So I normally... We, we try to start with people needs and then with a new vocation of old spaces. New vocation. And at the end, we will have the best dress code. But at the end. So body, soul, and then... And Amanda, you must have come up against that as well, particularly a high-density city that we're talking about. People must always often say housing first and... Yeah that there's not time or space or energy for some of these amazing, <laughs> look at that in Vancouver, that we're seeing. What would you respond? Well, first, you should never have to choose between the two. They okay. should have both of those necessities. But I think um, when we think about it, we remember that during the pandemic, many people deserted cities. Yes. And... Didn't come back, so. And they, this is true. And they went to places, that, destinations that were healthier and calmer and greener. And, um, bec and bo because of mobility and because of technology and remote learning, remote work, yeah. uh, people can actually choose which city gives them the best quality of life, which mm -hmm. best meets their needs. So cities are going to have to compete now for health and well-being, quality of life, protection from climate-related events, because um, people are, it's, it's going to be, it, it is going to be a competition. Um, but cities who actually invest in na immersive nature within cities are going to have a better chance of attracting newcomers and keeping their citizens. And it may turn out that people actually choose one city over another for this kind of nature that you see. And that is radical thinking, because before it was kind of the city held the power, but now you're telling me that the people might hold the power over the city. Yes, the city can't lose their people. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's about. And, and that maybe is a crucial point, that uh, from the city we, we, we get to an urban landscape. That is completely different. In a city, normally we think about stress, we think about uh, uh, working Lucia. hard and so on. So in the urban landscape, we feel, uh, first of all, we feel a little bit well. And uh, uh, we, we find out our own horizon. And everybody from us want to reconnect themselves, our own nature, with something that's growing up in a public space. So public space is not only for being there to service our own business, but public space more and more gets a platform for a new urban nature. So we, that is a healthy city. That is a human uh, uh, being city we are looking for. So I'm thinking you're seeing some of these pictures. Look at that from Vietnam. Uh, oh, Golden Bridge, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> being held in the hand. Citizens being held in the hand of that city. Um, what about the people who live in the city or maybe the people that are in this room? What tools do they have to try and, I don't know, be a part of this process to make it happen? Well, first of all, they have to feel this importance. And I think okay. m probably most people in this room today went through an experience during COVID where you wanted to be in a park more or whether you wanted to be um, close to small beauty um, and maybe where you took your time um, to, to take your time. Yeah. And I think that there is something that happened during COVID where we feel this it's almost a primal need uh, for the healing power of nature. And I think this is something that has to be part of the conversation and part of these images that you say that this is what we have to have in our city. And anything less than that feels inadequate. Which is amazing because I think some of us might be looking at these images going, that's amazing, but I don't know if that would happen in my city, even that it's almost outside the realm of imagination. But it's not, says it's Amanda. Not. <laughs> Andreas, what would you be advising people that want to make it happen? Well, uh, first of all, listening, listening. Uh, you, you all know that uh, urban gardening was, uh, was a good trend. Uh, uh, urban agriculture starts uh, to come in. But then normally... What are we doing? 
we, we make a regulament for everything. But at the end, in our cities, we need free space. Free space for nature means free space for people. So that, that is what we need to break. We have a lot of asphalt we don't know, we don't uh, uh, use in our cities. So I think the first will be uh, the best. So be radical and let's break it. Break let's down the break asphalt it. <laughs> and build something new. If you, if you yeah, build, build it, they will new. come. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk, I want to end just talking and feel free uh, uh, to pop in on uh, any other point you want to make. But I think on, on hope, uh, because I find this also inspiring. Do you feel hopeful that cities can get to this point that you're talking about, Amanda, in a cash strap time? You know, all the headlines seem to be on lack instead of abundance. Well, there's many cities that are doing this, and you've seen the pictures of some in Look Thailand. Look at the Bronx River. Exactly, and the Bronx <laughs> River. <laughs> and Thailand and Singapore and Dubai. And um, I think that this is going to be something that um, will be something that cities, one, they need, to, they need to invest in, but they understand that there are all of these things we've just talked about. It's the personal need during health, mm. for health reasons, for personal reasons. It's the city's needs to fight the climate events, and each one of those climate events can be addressed by this really intense, immersive, expansive nature. And finally, it's what city do people want to go to? In. What do they yeah. want to? Where do they want to stay? And what's that quality of life? So, is this, as it's part of the conversation and demand. It's going to, cities are maybe going to have to radically adjust their priorities and their spending plans. Radical change for cities. Your last thought there, Andreas. Are you hopeful? Well, uh, after all, I uh, weren't here. So I'm really hopeful, and uh, United Nations are with, with us all hopeful, because last year they bring out the nature capital accounting. So while we are sitting here, in our cities, we produce nature, not only in our national parks, not only in our gardens, but street by street. So let us be hopeful together and uh, break it together by nature capital accounting. And that can be some new part in our own story that, uh, uh, that also other people, not only we as a gardener or landscape architects, uh, try to understand what does it mean that nature is not only a luxury, but nature is something we need day by day. Essential, radical thinking. Excellent. Thanks so much to Andreas Thank you. and Amanda. Thank you.